life is easy when you're up on the mountain you've got peace of mind like you've never known but things change when you're down in the valley don't lose faith for you're never alone For the God of the mountain Is still God in the valley When things go wrong He'll make them right And the God of the good times Is still God in the bad times the God of the day is the God in the night. And we talk of faith when we're up on the mountain. The talk comes so easy when life's at its best. Down in the valley. Trials and, and temptations. temptations That's when faith Is really put to the test For the God of the mountain Is still God in the valley When things go wrong He'll make them God of the good times is still God in the bad times. The God of the day is still God in the night. The God of the day is still God. Um, Heavenly Father, I do want to come before your throne of grace. I thank you, Lord. This is an alternate thing to what we had originally planned. Lord, you're in control of all things. We may not be, Lord, gathering in the park tomorrow morning, but Heavenly Father, we know that even though the family is not assembled, even though our people, Lord, must for safety's sake stay in their remote places, still, Lord, you have a loving concern for our spiritual well-being. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would take control in my heart and mind. I pray, Father, that you would clear away all the, any chaotic thoughts, Lord. And give me a warm focus and an understanding upon your word, what it means, its significance to our lives. I ask that you would help me to preach it passionately and earnestly. I pray, Heavenly Father, that because you know exactly what the needs are, Lord, you would work in my heart by your Holy Spirit so that I might say those things, Lord, that might prove helpful. Maybe there's a word, a comment, an observation, Lord, that you can prompt me to make that would uh, in some special way meet the need of an individual. Lord, I just want to surrender myself before you. Um, I plead the blood over my, my soul. Um, I have no worthiness but that which Jesus Christ supplies. But Lord, I do have... A, a job that you've assigned me in your providence and I thank you for it and I'm very appreciative of it and I ask Lord for your help in, in doing good on it and Lord so just I pray that this message would be recorded without a hitch and Lord that I might be able to preach it Lord with uh, your spirit assisting me and we're going to give you grace and thanks for that and Lord also you know, there are so many people already that I do know, Lord, that they're dealing with something or other. It may be the COVID, and I'm sure in some cases it obviously is. And Lord, but I just pray that you would bless our church health-wise too. The many people, and perhaps some, Lord, that I'm not even aware of, they may be suffering something or other. Lord, just give them all grace. Lord, keep Jim here safe. Lord, I'd hate to see him or Linda get anything, and I know he was exposed recently, so keep him safe, Lord. And, you know, Dave and Marilyn, uh, I give them a quick recovery. Same for Gary and Letha. 
Same for the Hernandez family. Lord, and be with Ethan, Lord. I guess it's just strep throat, but we're going to have to test him to make sure there isn't something else. And Lord, we'll just give you thanks for all that you do, Lord. We pray this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Above all power, above all kings, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man. Above all kingdoms, above all thrones, above all wonder the world has ever known, above all wealth and treasures of the earth. There's no way. And thought of me above all, above all power, above all kings, above all nature. And all the ways of man You were here before the world began Above all kingdoms Above all thrones Above all wonders And treasures of the earth There's no way to measure what you were Crucified, laid behind the stone You lived to die, rejected thought of me above all you took the fall and thought of me above I want you to go ahead and open up your Bibles, if you will, to Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8. And while you're turning there, let me just go ahead and put a question forward for you to reflect on. It's a very simple question. Why does God allow troubling circumstances to fall upon man? Now, I know someone might say, well, you know, most of our troubles are of our own making. And I suppose that is true. 
if uh, just discounting God and relying only on the fact that he created a law of sowing and reaping, we know that given the way men live, yeah, sometimes they're their own worst enemies. And I, I, I'll, I'll grant you that um, very, very often we see that the trials and the troubles that come our way, they're traceable to our own doings in one form or another. Uh, that's true throughout human society, but not always, you know. And sometimes we find that even amongst those people that are really doing their be dead level best to please God and to walk with him, that they too, all of a sudden, they are appointed times of trial. Job said, you know what, months of weariness can be appointed unto me. I might say that 2020 and going on into 2021 was for many people many months of weariness. There have obviously been trials, and some of them are appointed by God. And listen, the scriptures themselves, they do declare that God tests. He tries men. That's part of what he does. God proves man. It came to pass that God did test Abraham. And we read about that there on Mount Moriah. We read about Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, being tested and tried in the wilderness. You know, Peter, he said, he said, don't think it's strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. That's not some strange thing. You're a Christian, okay? You are to expect some of these things. And, and James added, and he said, you know what, brethren? Just go ahead and count it all joy. When you fall into diverse te uh, testings and temptations. So, but we might specifically ask about God's good reasons. God's not an arbitrary, undesigning being. He is the supreme intelligence, and he's also moved by benevolence, so that that is one of his principal attributes in determining what he does and why he does things. So why, and I'm underscoring that word, why is it then that God sometimes puts us up for trial and testing? What is his good purpose for doing so? We understand that being God, he certainly must have a good purpose. Well, we actually have good purposes that are revealed to us here in this chapter, Deuteronomy chapter 8. What I'm going to do here this morning is I'm going to read the entire chapter. Uh, it's, it's, it's a good thing. The whole thing is integrated. So let's just look at it together. Deuteronomy chapter 8. I'll begin reading at verse number 1. All the commandments which I command thee this day shall you observe to do that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swore unto your fathers. And you shall remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years. Remember now Deuteronomy is a recapitulation, so all of that 40 years of wilderness wandering is kind of behind them and what Moses is doing here, he knows he's not actually going to be going into the promised land, but he feels as leader a responsibility to prepare them by giving them kind of an overview, uh, a repeat of their history. And so he's going to bring out some things, underscore certain spiritual principles that he knows to be utterly vital to their success and well-being when they arrive in the promised land. So these are important things he's going to teach them in this passage. He says in verse 2, Thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee, or we could translate that to test thee to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled thee, and suffered thee to hunger, and he fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee to know that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Thy clothing waxed not old upon thee, neither did thy foot swell these forty years. 
thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man chastens his son, so the Lord thy God chastens thee. Therefore thou shalt keep the commandment of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and to fear him. For the Lord thy God, he bringeth thee into a good land, a land of brooks, of water, of fountains and depths that spring out of valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of oil, olive, and honey, a land wherein thou shalt eat bread without scarceness. Thou shalt not lack anything in it. A land whose stones are iron, and out of whose hills thou may dig brass. When you have eaten and are full, then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he hath given thee. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes which I command thee this day. Lest when thou hast eaten and are full, and hast built goodly houses and dwelt therein, and when thy herds and thy flocks multiply, and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied, and all that thou hast is multiplied, then your heart be lifted up, and you forget the Lord your God, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt, from out of the house of bondage, who led thee through that great and terrible wilderness, wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought, where there was no water, and who brought thee forth water out of the rock of flint, who fed thee, in the wilderness with manna, which thy fathers knew not, that he might humble thee, and that he might prove thee to do thee good at thy latter end. And if you say in your heart, My power and the might of my hand have gotten me all this wealth, but you shall remember the Lord thy God for he it is that gives thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swear unto your fathers, as it is this day. And it shall be, if you do it all, forget the Lord thy God, and walk after other gods, and serve them, and worship them, I testify against you this day that you shall surely perish as the nations which the Lord God destroyeth before your face. So you shall perish because you would not be obedient unto the voice of the Lord your God. Now, I wanted to talk to you this morning about God proving man. We actually saw two references right here in this chapter that both signify that, yeah, that is a practice. It is something that God does. He is involved in the testing of men, don't we? I think we have one of those patriotic hymns. He's sifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. And so it is that the Lord looks upon earth and he looks upon the hearts of men and his eyelids try, the psalmist says, the hearts of men. He studies us. Job points out out a number of times and he has good reasons. And really what I want to do here, given the fact undeniable that God does test men, what is the manner of his testing as revealed in this passage right here. We'll just look at it and we'll see the, the kinds of tests that we can expect to be coming upon us. What are the manner of his tests that uh, are exemplified in this chapter? And then we're going to move on to his purpose in testing because he actually gives us three reasons in this chapter as to why it is 
that he does test man. Like I said, God, he's, he's the supreme intelligence in the universe. He is the one that he is mine. Right, And he does nothing arbitrarily but according to a benevolent intention. And we need to understand what his purposes are so that if the testing comes our way, then we might be able to respond rightly to it and not just get bitter. But we might know that there is good in his heart. right? And there is nothing extraordinary about being tested. As a matter of fact, we should count it all joy when we fall into various trials. So uh, we're going to first of all look at verse number two, and we're going to see that one of the manners in which God tests us, and we're actually going to see various manners uh, as we consider the history here, but uh, if if we just look at verses two and three, he says, You shall remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee to humble thee, and to test thee, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you, and he suffered you to humble, and he fed you with manna which you knew not, neither did your fathers know, that he might make you to know that man does not live by bread only, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God doth man live. Now, like I already mentioned, Deuteronomy is a recapitulation. So um, when Moses is speaking to the children, he's flagging to them throughout this whole chapter certain things that they would remember. Uh, For example, the, the whole mention that he had at one point in time of water and thirst That is accounted for right off the bat. Uh, I won't have you turn there, but in Exodus chapter 15, you might want to make a note of it and study Exodus chapter 15 in this connection of God testing man because the whole latter half of that chapter, it talks about a time when Israel had crossed over the Red Sea. They were beginning their wilderness wandering and almost right off the bat, they fell into a test. They had just... You know, they had been singing songs of praise to the Lord who triumphed gloriously over the entire Egyptian army, burying them in the Red Sea. And now they were thirsty. They had nothing to drink. And they began to complain about it. They came upon some water. They decided, oh, oh, man, water at long last. And so they bowed down, they, they kneeled down there to try and drink some of this water, and there was a sharp disappointment as they realized the water was bitter. It was unpotable. They could not stand to drink it. So at least right there we see two different things that sometimes happens our way in, in order to test us. Number one, sometimes we're, we're, we're tested by privations. That happens. Sometimes the Lord can allow us to enter a season of leanness in which we have less of what maybe we want. And that leanness, you know, it's not an accident. It's something that's on purpose. Other times, you know, he tests us by way of a certain disappointment that he allows to befall upon them. Can you just imagine as thirsty as they all were, as needy as they all were of water, when they finally came upon this pool at Mara, oh, they, they, you know how they were so excited, undoubtedly, and eager then to get that first sip of cool, clean water. And when they uh, uh, knelt down to drink of that water and found out to their horror and surprise that the water could not even be drunk, and it was an anticlimax. It was something that they had thought that it would be a refreshing thing, and that disappointed them. You know, sometimes we do suffer disappointments. My son Ethan was supposed to be going to Cedar Point today. He was very disappointed that you know he you know we we he, we couldn't allow him to go because he's not feeling up to it, and we don't know exactly what he has. You know, tomorrow I was supposed to be standing in the park at Blissfield, and you all were supposed to be sitting right out there in front of me, and now here I am, you know, 
I'm in a vacant sanctuary preaching to a camera, and, and it's, it's a little bit of disappointment. And we might ask in our hearts, you know, well, God, why? Why do you test us and try us every moment? Every moment? And we're going to get into that, his reasons for doing it. But yeah, there is testings of privation, testings of um, uh, disappointment, and even testings of impossible circumstances where all of a sudden God puts us in a circumstance where we just don't know what to do. We don't have a solution. And that was exactly the circumstance that they were in in Exodus 15, that the, the whole story of Mara and the bitter waters. You know, Moses didn't know what to do. This is well out of his power. But you know what? There had been all along through this whole thing, God had had a tree standing by. And at a certain point in time, the Bible says God showed him the tree. Now, the tree had always been there. Uh, not only had God ordained that they arrive at Mara when and w they did, he ordained that the tree should be right there, but they didn't know about it. And, and, and God was busily watching on, and, and Moses, he took that tree, and when he cast it into the waters, they went from being bitter, not just to being ordinary, that would have been good. If, if those bitter waters were simply made potable, that they could drink, that would have been wonderful. But the Bible says that when that tree was cast into the waters, the waters went from being bitter to being sweet. I, I tell you, that reminds me of one who died upon a tree. Because my life without that, without him dying on a tree, was would end up as nothing but bitterness. And now, Lord, how sweet my life can be. And why can there be sweetness in my soul? Why can there be joy in my life? It's because of Jesus Christ and because of him alone. And so these impossible circumstances, God is always ready to handle. Um, when, when Abraham was being tested, you know, he had the knife up about to plunge into his son. And God arrested him. He said, no, no. Abraham, this was a test. This was a test. I wanted to see if you loved me supremely. You do. You love me supremely. And you're willing to obey me, obey my commandment to you, even when all of your mind and all of your creaturely reason just bulks at the, at, at, at the commandment because it is so hard. Yet, nonetheless, you have a settled trust in me that you're able to even sit and say, well... You rationalize and figure that God must, in order to keep his promises, raise my son up from the dead. So God says, Abraham, I don't want you to do that. It's actually my own son who will be raised up from the dead, not your son. The death of Isaac won't accomplish my purposes, but you know what? I need a faithful man to work through to bring my son who will accomplish my purposes into the world. And, and, and then all of a sudden, Abraham looked. And you know what was there all along? A, lamb, a ram, his horns tangled in a thicket. Now, why he hadn't seen it, but it's kind of like that tree that all of a sudden God was watching. God was studying. God had everything under control. He does this. He does it deliberately. You know, there's this thing in the, in the New Testament where, you know, there's a whole crowd of people, 5,000 men, not counting the women and children, They've been following Jesus. It's getting to, you know, midday. They're all quite hungry. They have nothing to feed them. And Jesus, he looks at his disciples and he said, you know, what do we have to feed these people? You know, he asked them that the Bible says to test them. It was an impossible situation. They had nothing to feed them. And he was just kind of like surveying their hearts with a question. Okay, he himself knew exactly beforehand just what he would do. And when they fumbled and faltered, they did what they could do. That is to say, they looked back to Jesus as the only one that they could look to to have an answer, and they put their trust in him. Lord, what, what, what do we do? I mean, uh, to answer your question, there, there, there's this boy here. He's got his fishes and his loaves, but what do we do? And he says, well, you just make everybody sit down. This is an impossible situation. And impossible situations are remedied by God. And, you know, Jesus took care of it. But it's, it wasn't just privations. You know what? 
there's also a kind of a testing that God visits upon men that's, that's of the opposite extreme. And, and I think it's really a more deadly test. And I think it's really the test that um, at least America nationally, that corporately we as a people in a body politic, are, we are American citizens. And I think this secondary kind of test is the thing that we need to be more concerned about. Um, in order to see this, this is a, a testing that falls upon people by way of prosperity, okay? Yes, privations test us because, you know what, will we complain when the privation comes? But prosperity tests too because when, when the prosperity comes, will we forget our God? So look at verse 7 here. I'll read from 7 to 14, and you'll see that prosperity is oftentimes designed to test the hearts of men. For the Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land, a land of brooks, of water, of fountains and depths that spring out of hills and valleys, a land of wheat and barley and vines, of fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey, a land wherein thou shalt eat bread without scarceness. You'll have plenty. Thou shalt not lack anything in it. A land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you may dig brass. You know, in America, we have been signally blessed with the Lord. We have rich wheat fields, you know. We have natural resources such that what we want to do as a nation, we can do it. God put at our disposal all these enormous blessings. And so he warns there in verse 10, he says, beware, right? He says, when you have eaten and you are full, then you better bless the Lord your God. You better be thankful to him in your heart for the good land which he gave you. Not because you deserved it, because of his plans and the fact that he would bless you. And you must beware that you do not forget the Lord your God in keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes which I command ye this day. Lest when you have eaten and are full and have built goodly houses and dwelt in them and when your herds and your flocks are multiplied, your silver and your gold is multiplied, and all that you have, it's all multiplied. Then your heart is lifted up, and you forget the Lord thy God. That is a dangerous thing. You know, prosperity can be a very, very dangerous thing. I believe, people, that we're in a time of testing right now all across the world. If you were to say, what lies behind the strange COVID thing that has come upon us. What lies behind all the international turmoils and stuff like this? I would say that indeed God is sifting out the hearts of men and women before his judgment seat. I mean, that's one of the things, that's one way, one perspective we can have on it, that there is an individual kind of sifting and sorting that is going on that we as individuals need to be made aware of. That... God will visit. And you know what? I don't know how he's going to test you. It may be that he will give you a disappointment in life. Maybe you will have certain privations that you need to wait patiently upon him in order to fill your cup to the level that you desire. He may pour out such an abundance upon you that all of a sudden you are put to an inward test as to where your allegiance really lies. I don't know what the nature of the test or trial that may face you, but I will promise you this. Even individuals are necessarily tested of the Lord, and not just individuals too. We can look at this. This is a principle. Actually, when Moses is speaking here, he is speaking, you know, at the, at the national level. He's speaking about God's dealings with Israel as a corporate whole. God deals with nations according to judgment, too. It's not just Israel, okay, that God says, you know what, I'm going to deal with you and chasten with you as a national body politic. You know, it's not just Babylon that is weighed in the balances and their days are numbered. You know, they're found wanting. It's not just 
uh, Egypt that God says, you know what, you keep going in that way, I will get me honor upon you. This is something that is necessarily true of all nations. God is judging all people. Now, but let's kind of like just go ahead and turn and twist now and go to the other idea. I think that we all, you know, we pretty much realize that, yeah, sure, God's, God does have means and methods and a right to test people. So, but what are his good reasons? And this is kind of important for this reason, because I think that this will be able to allow us to focus helpfully on his good purposes. And he does have good purposes for allowing tests to come. He, you know, he, he's, not, he's not a bully. Sometimes God gets bad wrapped in our society. There are so many people that are willing to try and find fault with the faultless one. You know, we ought to find fault with ourselves because we can do honest good justice on finding fault with our own hearts and lives, and we know it. But if you're going to be honest, there's no fault to be found with God, and he has every right in the world to test us. And when we understand why he does so, it should cause us to bow our heads in reverence and say, Thank you, Lord. Search me. Try me. Test me. Lord, please, I need you to visit me in such a way that I can learn some things. Because that's the first thing I'm going to point out here. God tests you in order to teach you. God tests you in order to teach you. I mean, if you look at that second verse again, what did he say? He says, to humble you and to prove you or to test you, to know what was in your heart. Well, for who to know what was in your heart? I mean, did God have any doubts about what was in the heart of Israel? Did God need to do experiments in order to confirm some hypothesis that he might have had about what Israel was really like in their heart? Did God have to resort to some kind of experimental testing in order to gain a deeper insight into what was going on in their soul? You know, absolutely not. There's nothing about any of us that God doesn't already know to the full. God is not a man that he should enter into a process of learning. So we are the ones that learn by the presentation of evidence our way. And to be honest with you, it is we that are brought to a state of enlightenment. It is we that are taught the truth and gain a respect for reality. That's what he wants us to do. He's, he's with us to bless us. And, but we, he, we need to have a respect for reality, and we need to be taught some things. For example, first, God ordains tests to reveal the truth about ourselves so that we can look honestly at ourselves so that we can recognize our insufficiencies for what they are. I mean, you know, men, they do have a natural tendency to think more highly of themselves than what they ought to think. Pride, it just has an inflated opinion. That is the nature of pride, to think, to suppose more and better of itself than what it ought to. But when all of a sudden a test comes, you know what it begins to do? A lot of our misconceptions, a lot of our vain conceits, we ourselves are forced to realize and confess that they don't stack up. And, and they force us to take that humble step of saying, you know what, Lord, I, I got to be honest here before you. I am a sinner. I am a man of weakness. I am a man that can't get by except you help me to get by. I need you, God. I've looked into my own heart and I've seen nothing there but more and more need for you because I am far from a perfect man. And when we get there, we're starting to, what the Bible calls, grow in grace. That's, that's the language of a man who's growing in grace. He's looking at the shallowness and incompleteness and insufficiencies of his own self. You know, the world will teach you to do exactly the opposite. They will teach you to think, well, you're really somebody. Well, you may be somebody in God's estimation as a child of his that he can love and redeem and use. But if you just draw a circle about yourself and say, what is in that circle that is so great and wonderful? My friend, there's nothing in there. In order for you to be great and wonderful, you need input from your maker and he can make you to be what you ought to be. And, and we learned this. When we're tried, we begin to learn where we are. And not only that, divine trials, they're designed. 
They are designed to teach us the truth about God. So, yes, we're learning about our insufficiency, but we're also, every time we go through a trial, we begin to be taught about the all-sufficiency of God. That is, we will be if we wait faithfully upon him and give him opportunity not just to prove us, but to prove himself before us. You know, how many of the saints of old, we say of people, you know, the Old Testament heroes, you know, we say of them, they were men, they were women who knew their God. They knew their God, and because they knew their God, they were strong and could walk with him. And yet, you go back and you read in the book of Hebrews, and you find that every one of these great heroes of the faith who, quote, knew their God. Their life was attended by a multiplicity of trials. And, and frankly, it was through the trials that they got to know their God. How would Abraham know Jehovah Jireh if he had not met him on Mount Moriah? You know, there are times when it is we walk away from the time of testing, from the wrestling at the fort of Jabbok, from whatever the nature of the thing is, we're tested and we're tried, and we hang on to God because we've got no place else to go, and we step away from that trial, and you know what? We're enriched as men and women. We are more afterwards than what we were beforehand, and that's a blessed thing because we're learning something about God. As a matter of fact, if you look at the fifth verse, he sums it right there. This is not just arbitrary testing or arbitrary proving. It is, we can call it a form of chastisement. Uh, you shall consider in your heart that as a man chastens his son, so the Lord chastens thee. You know, testing is a part of our training. It is something that the Lord does as a chastisement to exercise ourselves up in a good trust in, in him. But let me give you another good reason why the Lord sometimes allows tests to come our way. You'll find this one in verse number 16. So if you look down there at verse 16, here's the second reason, not just to teach us, but something else. It says that he might humble thee and that he might prove or test thee. Why? To do thee good at thy latter end. Let me put it this way. God tests you with a view to blessing you. I mean, everything about God is designed to bless. God is the great blesser. Make that all capitals. He is the fount of every blessing. And he, made it, he, he created man, why? Well, he created man to bless him. Well, man fell, so what did God do? He redeemed man. Well, what did he redeem him for? He redeemed him so that he could go about again blessing him. I mean, God's primary principal intention towards the human race, if you were to assess the heart of God, what he desires to do, he wants to bless men, and he wants to do so by bringing them into his divine embrace. He wants them to know him, to enjoy him, to live a life of obedience to him, and therefore glorify him, and, and have his share of his love, and of his spirit, and of his life, it's, it's a blessing beyond what we can really enjoy. But God does have a problem here. I mean, God can't bless a rebel. Um, he cannot. I mean, he will not pour out the treasure store of his divine grace upon those who their hearts are proud and self-serving and don't thank him nor even acknowledge him but turn away you know they're not in a fit condition to receive the blessing god has to therefore bring men to the level where he can bless them and you know isn't that what we just got finished observing we just got finished observing that the results of god's testing are twofold number one he's teaching us and he's teaching us humility towards ourselves and he is teaching us a reverent faith towards him and both of these things if you stop and you think about them they open up a pathway or a channel that would allow blessing to come god can't bless you while you're full of yourself god can't uh bless you while you're running headstrong in your own way like you know lucifer 
wanting his own self-exaltation. But when you appear before him broken, with a contrite heart and willing to submit to his lordship and his law, when you welcome him and take his will as yours, you know what? He delights in that moment to pour out a blessing. So he trains us the truth to respect reality about ourselves, about himself. Why? Because, you know, God always looking further ahead. He looks always further down the road than men do. We, men, man is born impatient. You know, I, I see my children a lot of time, you know, children, they want their portion right now. Their eyes, what they see affects their heart. And their heart desires an immediate gratification of what they want. And it seems like sometimes it's very difficult for even adult people to outgrow this thing. We're impatient for an immediate blessing to come our way. But God is looking way down the road. He wants to actually bless you and I more and above the blessing that we would crave. You know, we crave the things of this world, perhaps. We crave, it could be money, it could be you know, a, 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 you know, a girlfriend or a boyfriend, it, you know, whatever it happens to be, God says, you know, I understand the blessing of all that, but you know, there are better blessings. You know, there are higher blessings. You know, there are blessings so far above the things of this world that I tell you what, I want to pour out something richer and I'm, and I'm intending to do so. And this is what he does with his children. He designs a pathway to lead you into the future whereby now, in the present moment, your character is being formed. You are becoming more Christ-like. What is God doing? He's preparing within your heart and mind the ability to receive blessing from him in such a way that you can receive it safely. Um, you know, God can't really pour out his blessing on an untested man, one not proven in the school of life. That's, that's exactly the reason why Paul, you remember in, it was 1 Timothy chapter 3, Paul, he's saying, he's giving out a list of qualifications for entering the pastorate. And one of the things he says there is not a novice, not a rookie, no really young, untested, untried man should be put into that place of spiritual headship. And he says, why? And, and, and basically he says, He's liable to fall into the temptation and, and the same problem that the devil had where it goes to his head. He's basically he says, don't put a young, untried, unproven man into the pulpit, lest all of a sudden he gets a swell head and it hurts him. It's not safe for him. I think just about all of God's greatest blessings are kind of that way. You know, maybe God doesn't pour out as mighty a blessing on some ministers as he did upon George Whitefield for a variety of reasons. Maybe because of the people to whom they're sent. But maybe it's because he knows that in their heart, that person really can't, they don't have the internal humility and stability to receive that much anointing and that much power and not have it, in a sense, go to their heart or their head in the way of a pride thing. But for whatever reason, God does uh, test you because he is ultimately designing to bless you. And here's the last thing. God tests all men because he is that judge who will someday divide all men. And when we actually get down to the end of the chapter and we read those final verses we see that and the whole chapter really is uh, aiming at this. Yes, he's teaching men. Yes, he's angling to bless those men whom he will give him place in their life. But ultimately, the tests and the trials, you know, they have a twofold effect. They are a double-edged sword. And someday we will be judged and tried before the Lord. And how we have responded in this life of testing will affect our eternal destiny. Why don't you look at beginning at verse 17, and we'll just read down to the end of the chapter. Verse 17 says, And you say in your heart, My power and the might of my hand has gotten me all this wealth. Sounds like King Nebuchadnezzar right before the 
you know, the judgment fell on him, right? Is not this great Babylon which I have built for the honor of my majesty? You know, that's a dangerous thing. Boy, when people are not giving glory to God, they're not thankful for what they have. They're taking all the credit and trying to bask in the glory and say, I, I am good, I am wise. They are hurtling. People, they're hurtling for judgment. Even if they live in America, they're hurtling for judgment. He says in verse 18, but you shall remember the Lord your God, for he it is to get power to get wealth. It's not like God's stingy and doesn't want you to enjoy the things of this world. He wants you to have straight priorities. He wants you to be able to enjoy the things of this world so that they don't destroy your connection to him as the primary allegiance you have. The most important thing in the life of any child of God ought to be God. And, we, you know, Paul said, I I'm willing to count all things lost if I can have but more of Jesus Christ. He's worth more than everything else combined. And he is. And that's the right attitude. And when you have that kind of attitude, God can pour out some pretty mighty blessings upon a heart that's so prepared. And it says in verse 19, it shall be now listen to this, this is sobering, but this has to do with the fact that God is the judge. It says, it shall be, if you do at all forget the Lord thy God, and walk after other gods, and you serve them, and you worship them, I testify against you this day that you shall surely perish. There's no doubt about it. As the nations which the Lord destroyed before your face, right? Og, king of Bashan, the others, he said, you know what? You go down their path, you will arrive at their destiny. Now, I, uh, I already mentioned earlier that I think that if we look at our own nation, America, and some people have often compared Israel to America. And this very passage, actually, that I've read is oftentimes been made a suitable message for reflecting upon how we, as Americans, ought to react towards the blessings that God has given to us. This began very early in the founding of our nation. As a matter of fact, I'm just going to read you a little quote here in, in closing. I thought it was so prophetic and so profound. It was actually preached by a man named Samuel Wales. It was preached shortly after we became a nation, okay? The date of its preaching was May 12, 1785. And it was actually not preached in a church. It was preached uh, before the General Assembly of the State of Connecticut. So it was a kind of a political message in the sense that uh, Pastor Wales, Reverend Wales, was addressing... Um, civil leaders and he was addressing those that were citizens and he was addressing them as fellow Americans and he wanted to give them a warning and it was based upon this kind of reasoning there he called that he titled his message the dangers of our national prosperity and the way to avoid them and let me just read a little bit of what Samuel Wales said he said the history of the Israelites shows us that they greatly needed the caution which Moses gave them. Scarcely a prosperous period in their history can be pointed out which was not followed by a decay of piety and a corruption of morals. This was the case soon after their happy settlement in the land of Canaan. This was very frequently the case in the times of their judges and kings, and this was imminently the case with respect to their highest state of wealth and power under the reign of Solomon. The very great prosperity of this, unhappy, of this happy reign produced very unhappy effects, even upon that wise king, as well as upon his court and his subjects. Even in the reign of pious Hezekiah, ingratitude and irreligion were the consequences of success and prosperity. And then he shifts from Israel and he's speaking of Christianity and what we have seen 
as a like principle in Christian church history, he he wrote this. The consequences of outward prosperity have been more often fatal to the Christian cause than those of adversity. You know, that is so very true. Oftentimes when adversity comes, the church is strengthened. Christians, they face that adversity, and yeah, you know what? That, that, that's a hard thing. But rather than ruin them, if they respond with faith in their hearts towards God, and this is often the case that they will, it can build them up. So here's the thing. If we, if we have entered a season of testing individually and nationally, even globally, and I, think, I really think we have, and I want to say that we as Christians, we ought not to complain. We ought not to have any word of complaint found in our mouths about political things per se, about other things per se. We are to take what comes our way as administered by the hand of a provident God who saw all in advance and is watching us and is counting on us to show the spirit of Jesus Christ to the world round about us. It ill uh, befits a Christian to give themselves, like uh, Israel did, to murmuring in a wilderness. If this be a time of testing and trial for us, you know what? Here's the thing. We need to kiss the hand that may smack us with a chastening blow. We need to say, after all, Lord God, your will is best. After all, Lord God, um, my iniquity is such that you have chastised me less than what I actually deserve. And if we give him our hearts in full, I believe that these are times in which we can see great blessing. And I'm not predicting any great blessing necessarily on a corporate level. I mean, you know, nationally upon America as a whole. That'd be wonderful. But I will say that at least upon the children of God, if we respond rightly, we can see great blessing. And I just wanted to urge that on us. Let's not think it strange concerning fiery trials that may visit us. Actually, let us rejoice knowing it's part of the program and the end result is good, very good. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord. There are so many passages in the Bible that talk pretty much about this, Lord. The fact that you have indeed appointed a reason for us, Lord, to look to you even in times of difficulty and trial. We are appointed that through much affliction to enter into the kingdom of God. This is a wisdom of God we dare not question. We simply look to you for grace and we ask for it humbly. In Jesus' name, amen.